Sunny Sullen Fields, how are you doing today? Good. Good. That, that was pretty good. Somebody out there. Hey, I'm so glad to be hanging out with you today. I've been away for a couple of weeks, and I'll talk about that a little bit uh, later. Let me tell you, uh, I'll give you an announcement before we get started. Uh, the, I, I want to encourage you to be here for the next two weeks. Uh, the next two weeks we're going to be are going to be special weeks in the life of the church. Next week we're going to do an update on vision for the church and going to let you know what we've done so far in this six or seven months about moving the church forward vision wise. And we're going to we're going to announce some things that are going to be happening in the next month and a half that continue to move us. Uh, toward the vision. We're excited about that. We're going to encourage you to get involved in some of that and uh, engage some of that. So we're excited about that. And the week after that, I'm going to have a good friend of mine, uh, Jack Connell, who's going to be speaking here. And he's one of the very best speakers I've ever heard for a church. And so I want to encourage you to be there. And if you're out at home and maybe you don't get in here because of a number of things, I want to encourage you to be in the seats or uh, here uh, that week if you can. And so I want to encourage you and just have you put that on the calendar and make sure that you engage those two weeks. I know there's a lot of stuff going on in your lives, but I think you will want to be involved in the next two weeks as we begin to move vision forward uh, here for the church. So I was, uh, I was out um, and uh, hanging out and doing a revival or a renewal week, and then I had some opportunities to do some stuff at my alma mater. I was celebrating my 30th uh, uh, reunion of my graduation from college. I just don't seem that old. And uh, I just don't seem that old. I, it was amazing to me. And I kept on thinking to myself, this has got to be 20. It's got to be 20, but it was 30. And uh, we'll talk about that. Hey, we're wrapping up the series today, the, the Real Relationship Series today. And um, we're wrapping it up. Uh, and we're, um, when we first decided to do this, I went to the staff and I said, hey, there's three different way, directions we can go in for fall. And the staff thought that real relationships would be a, a great place to go because here's the reality. We're called into relationship. We're called into relationship vertically. We're called to have a real relationship with God. And if you're here today and you don't have a real relationship with God or you're listening to me online and you don't have a real relationship with God, we're going to give you an opportunity before the service is closed today to have a real relationship with God. But, but not only are you called to have a real relationship with God, you're called to have a horizontal real relationships with people around you. And, and here's the deal, I, I, I've heard from some feedback that this has been a really tough series for people, that this has been one of those series that's been really tough for people to grasp. Sometimes it's been because uh, no one has ever believed in the person, or, or no, maybe no one's ever invested in you, or no one's ever mentored you, and so it's been a hard relationship with you, and, and, or maybe because, it's, because you don't feel like you have anything to offer anyone. So when you hear the question, who's investing in you, and who are you investing in, it becomes a hard question for you because you don't feel like you have anything to offer someone, or maybe you just feel like, well, God doesn't, uh, maybe God God can't invest in me. You know, I'm not worthy of God investing me. Whatever the case might be, it could be that it's been too formulaic. Maybe today uh, we're going to talk about this not being some kind of formula, this not being some kind of uh, situation that you plan out and you put together. Today we're going to talk about what I call real relationship lifestyle investment. Real relationship lifestyle investment. Because I am convinced, I am convinced that real relationships happen out of lifestyle and not because we come up with some kind of formula that's going to put together a real relationship. I heard someone say recently, I heard someone say recently that investing in others is a lifestyle. Investing in others is a lifestyle. In other words, it comes up out of who you are, not because you put something together or because you have a nice formula that you work together that somehow that's going to allow you to invest in others and others to invest in you. I believe it's a lifestyle. So as we wrap up the series, I want to look at mentoring and investing in others as a lifestyle. And I think one of the stories that does that the best is a story, the Old Testament story of Naomi and Ruth. 
I believe it, dis it displays it. It has five, what I call, five or six investment, lifestyle investment traits that need to be active in your life if you're going to be investing in others and having people investing you as a lifestyle. So um, turn with me if you have your Bibles. It's going to be on the screen to the book of Ruth. Let me give you some context for this, root, this book. According to the Talmud, the Jewish tradition, the prophet Samuel wrote the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth chronicles the story of Ruth and Oprah, two women of Moab, who were married to the son of Amalek and, and Naomi. They were Ju Judeans who had settled in Moab to escape the famine in Judah. Now, as it were to happen, all three of the men in that, in that situation died. So Oprah's wife died, uh, uh, Ruth's, Oprah's husband died, excuse me, Ruth's husband died, and then Naomi's husband died. So all three of the husbands died, leaving Ruth and Oprah and Naomi as widows. And after the deaths of their husband and their two sons, Naomi recognized that there was nothing left for her in Moab. So she made the decision that she was going to get herself together and she was going to go back to Judah from where she had come. And it's a very interesting thing. In that situation, when you lose your, when you lose your husband and then you lose both of your son-in-laws, you have no status in their culture. You have no status. You, you, usually, if you don't have a husband, if you don't have these son-in-laws, you're going to be poor. You're going to be destitute. And sometimes people even thought that somehow you were cursed because your husband died. And then the two people that were supposed to take care of you the, 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 these, uh, these sons, they died too. And so, so now you're destitute. And so Ruth uh, and Naomi and Oprah, they were all throwaways. So as, as Naomi is on her way back home, she says to her two daughters, her two daughters, listen, go back to your families. Go back to your families. You're young enough. You, you might, find, you might uh, find other husbands. You might have some kids. You'll be fine. Go back to your family. And she even says to them, even if I could, even if I could get pregnant again, which I can't, would you be willing to wait for my offspring so that you could marry them? No, go back. And so in Ruth 1, 8 through 9, here's what it says. After a short while on the road, Naomi told her two daughters-in-law, go back. Go home and live with your mothers, and may God treat you as graciously as you treated your deceased husbands and me. May God give each of you a new home and a new husband. She kissed them, and they cried openly. Now, this was some kind of real relationship, because we're talking about daughter-in-law and mother-in-law, right? Now, in our culture, sometimes those relationships aren't good, but apparently they had some good relationships because when, when they knew they were going to be leaving their mother-in-law, they cried. I mean, that's not what we hear. We hear people running away from their mother-in-law, but that's not the situation here. They, they cry. And so Oprah willingly goes. But Ruth refuses to leave Naomi. In fact, it, it says that, that, that Ruth clung on to Naomi and insisted to going to go with Naomi. Now, that she, now so Ruth was a Klingon. Not, not the Klingons from Star Trek situation, but she was a Klingon. When we was growing up, if you had a relationship where the person just kind of held really tight for you, to you and you couldn't get them to get away from you, we would call them Klingons. And no one wanted a Klingon, right? No one wanted that kind of relationship. Well, here's a situation where Ruth would actually grab onto her mother-in-law and would not let her go. So here's what it says in Ruth 16, 1, 16 and 18. But Ruth said, don't force me to leave you. Don't make me go home. Where you go, I go. And where you live, I live. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Not even, and where you're buried, that's where I'll be buried. <laughs> where, you, where you die, I'll die there. Uh, not even death itself is going to come between us. And when Naomi saw that Ruth had her heart set on going with her, she gave in. And so the two of them traveled together to Bethlehem. I mean, that is some kind of mother-in-law and daughter-in-law relationship. 
I mean, where you go, I'll go. Your people, my people. Your God, my God. Where you'll die, I'll die. And there I will be buried. That's what I call real relationship. Because we don't see those relationships. Those kind of relationships are far, few and far between because we're so ready to get away and to move away. There's some, there's some different things happening, some traits that we'll talk about. So Ruth goes with Naomi to Bethlehem. And in God's perfect timing, in God's perfect timing, a kinsman, you heard me talk about this in Revelation, if you were here for the series in Revelation, a kinsman redeemer is revealed in Boaz. And Ruth would later marry Boaz. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But let me talk about some traits, because there's some traits in this relationship, this mother-in-law and daughter-in-law relationships that I think are really, really important if we're going to do lifestyle lifestyle investment relationships. The first thing was loyalty. Can you think of anything more loyal than, can, than walking away from your future, basically? As it were, she walked, Ruth walked away from her future to follow her mother-in-law. Her decision to stay with Naomi is, is the first evidence of this trait of loyalty. Ruth refused to leave her mother-in-law. She clearly loved Naomi and showed her concern for her mother-in-law through the choices to remain there. Loyalty. In our culture today, there's no loyalty. No loyalty to significant others, no loyalty to spouses, no loyalty to jobs, no loyalty to church, no loyalty to each other. There's no loyalty at all. And here she is displaying in this lifestyle relationship kind of uh, relationship here what loyalty looks like. See, loyalty is essentially essential to a characteristic of lifestyle relationship building. A genuine investee and investor relationship is built on the foundation of loyalty to one another. The assurance that neither will betray the other. The assurance that, that people are going to stick things out. We don't see that kind of loyalty today. But, but, but Ruth had this loyalty. It, you, know, you know what it meant for her to not go home? It meant that she could potentially go as an outsider to Bethlehem. And she could be an outsider the whole time she was there. And she could not find a husband because she was an outsider, because she was cursed, because she was a doorway. But she made a decision that she'll be loyal to her, her mother-in-law. You know what I think? I think when we show that kind of loyalty, it comes back on us. I believe the law of reciprocity begins to be at work here. That when we show loyalty to someone else, it comes back on us a couple fold deeper or more loyalty. The second thing, it might sound like the same word, but the same idea, but it's not, is, is commitment. Commitment. After arriving in Judah, Ruth decided that she would join some of the other women and she would glean in the wheat. Here's how it worked. If you were destitute, if you were poor, this was their socials, this was their kind of welfare system set up in the Old Testament. So what they would do is they would have people come and glean the fields, and they would pick the fields, and they would pick the wheat. And if you were destitute and poor, you could ask the owner of the field, could you go behind the first folks who picked to see if any dropped by the wayside? And so that's how you would live. You would go and you would get permission and you would glean the wheat and see if there were any leftovers. And so this is what she did. Ruth gleaned the wheat to, uh, with other women picking up the leftover grain left by the harvesters. Now she asked for permission from Naomi to do so. And Naomi encouraged her, her mother-in-law encouraged her to do so. So Ruth, empowered by Naomi's support, began gleaning the fields. Ruth was so committed, so committed to caring for Naomi. This wasn't about Ruth. This wasn't about her. This was about her gleaning the fields because her, her mother-in-law had no status. She was a widowed woman. In that society, she had no status. So what Naomi was doing, what Ruth was doing is gleaning the fields so she can get some wheat so she could take care 
of her mother-in-law. That's commitment. Commitment is an important element of investment, of, of lifestyle investment. See, it requires that both people be committed to one another, that both people will continue to show up and continue investing in one another even when things go bad, even when things don't work out, even when the newness wears off. Investors and investees must be committed to this, this partnership as they follow in relationship Commitment. I don't even have to talk about commitment. Commitment seems to be a, a, a word of yesterday because we're, we're so busy looking out for ourselves and taking care of ourselves that sometimes it's hard for us to commit. And the next word follows it, this idea of selflessness. Selflessness. Ruth's decision to lay down her life in Moab, surrounded by her family, Surrounded by people who could take care of her. Surrounded by people of her own kin. And follow Naomi to Judah was a, was a selfless act. Ruth's choice to gather grain from the fields so that she could help feed Naomi was a selfless act. Successful lifestyle investment exemplifies selflessness. In situations where the investor or the investee is more concerned with the needs and the wishes of the other than they are with themselves. See, if you have a selfish person that you're in relationship with, they're going to look out for themselves first and foremost. That's not what Ruth did. Ruth was looking out for her mother. See, selflessness shows more concern for the other person than it does for ourselves. And, and like I said, that, that begins to boomerang. Maybe you know the story. It boomeranged in her life because she was selfless, because she, she was committed, because, because she was loyal. Then all of those things came back to her. Can I encourage you today? not only in relationships, in your regular relationships or your relationships where you're trying to invest in other people, but in all of our relationships, that stuff comes back on us. It comes back on us. Selfless investors and leaders have the best interest in the other person in mind. There was some trust that had to happen here. So not only, not, not long after Ruth is gleaning, she and Naomi discover Boaz. Now, Boaz was part of the family. Boaz was a man whose field she was working in and one of Naomi's husband's relatives. See, Boaz was eligible to be their kinsman redeemer. Boaz was eligible to come in and take care of that family. Boaz was eligible to do that. So not only was he in the position to help them long term, but he'd already begun to show uh, some interest in Ruth. And so, so what happens is, is Naomi says to Ruth, go and, uh, go and pique his curiosity, in other words. He's showing some interest in you. Be a little forward. Now, I know today, in today's society, it's nothing wrong with a woman being forward, a woman going after a guy. But in that culture, you didn't do that. In that culture, you waited to, for the man to come forward. And so Ruth, uh, Naomi says to Ruth, no, you go forward. And because, because Ruth trusts Naomi, she does exactly what Naomi says. And because of that, her and Boaz fall in love, and Boaz, and, and, and Boaz does this thing for her. Boaz uh, likes her so much that he lets her take a double pass of the gleaning. So when everybody else is getting one pass, when everybody else is getting one pass, he lets, he lets Ruth have a second pass because he likes Ruth. All happened because Ruth trusted her mother-in-law. I love the story of Naomi and Ruth because it's such a beautiful representation of God's, God's care. Both women, destitute, trusted God to deliver them from their circumstances. I know you're going through. We're all going through. This has been an interesting season. The question is, what do we do when we go through? Do we trust ourselves or do we trust God? 
I mean, they trusted God. They, they, uh, it, it, Ruth would have never left Moab with her mother-in-law to head to Bethlehem unless she had this idea that she trusted God. Remember what she says? Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. You got so to understand how the Moabites came together. The Moabites came together out of an incestuous relationship between a dad and a daughter. And so they were throwaways. So they were misfits. So they were nobodies. And so Ruth, just because of her mother-in-law and because she knew her mother-in-law, she began to trust in the God of her mother-in-law. And because she trusted in that God, she went with her mother-in-law. Trustworthiness is so central to investing in relationship. No one's going to allow you to invest in them if they don't, if they can't trust you. And you're not going to allow anybody to invest in you that you don't trust. Trust is so important. And it's so important not to break trust. Relationships are fragile. We've all had people that we trusted who broke the trust. And it becomes so hard to trust again. Part of my journey, part of my journey is I, as I became a Teflon person as I was growing up. Because some of the people that I should have been able to trust, I couldn't trust. And so I decided I would put Teflon on and I would wear Teflon. And, and I just thought, I remember they used to call Ronald Reagan a Teflon president. And I just decided I was going to be a Teflon guy. And you were never going to get close enough again to me to hurt me. And some of the, some of the most uh, amazing words that I ever heard was from a therapist, and I told you this, who said to me, it's not about Teflon, it's about Velcro. When trust is broken, it can be so hard to trust again. It's why it's so important that if you're investing in someone and someone's investing in you, trust is important. Trust is important, and trust makes all the difference in the world. There's another there's another trait here this, that is amazing. This, this trust, this trait of respect. Ruth respects Naomi. And because she does, she listens to her mother-in-law and she does what her mother-in-law says. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. That's how I learned how to spell the word. Respect. She respected, and so she took Naomi's suggestions, and because of that, her and Boaz got married. It was due to the esteem that Ruth had for Naomi that Ruth took the counsel of her mother-in-law. Ruth knew Naomi had her best interests in mind. She held Naomi in high regard. She respected her. It can take courage to listen to the advice of others, Certainly when there are risks involved, but respect will allow you to do that. See, is it what respect does? Respect ensures that both persons, the investor and the investee, have the ability to listen to one another and follow the encouragement of the other person. Respect. Some traits that are so Important if you're going to invest, if you're going to live a lifestyle of investing in others. I talk about a lifestyle because these things are going to have to be a part of who you are. Not some formula, not some I'm going to do this so I can do, get this. It's who you are. The Bible talks about this when it talks about Jesus and his investment in us. His, his leaving heaven and, and moving into the neighborhood. It was just who he is. It was just who he, who he is and who he was that he loved us so much. He loved us so much that he was just acting out the love that he had for us. So, so what are some, some lessons from this story? I love the story of Ruth and Naomi because one of the lessons is this. Your past does not have to define or does not have to put in cement your present or your future. 
Because, because they're nobodies, right? They, they are nobodies. It, 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 you know, we, we have certain people in our culture and certain people in our society that they do certain things, and once they do those things, they're throwaways. No one wants to be around them. No one wants to have them in their home. No one wants to have anything to do with them. Ruth was one of these people. She was, she was one of these people. And she had had a whole bunch of stuff before her. I mean, some, some people might say she was cursed. But she did not let her past dictate her present or her future. And maybe you're here today and you have a past that you're not proud of, a past that you don't speak of, a past that, that you dare not speak of. You're too embarrassed by it. And, and you think somehow your past is, is dictating your present and your future. And I want to say to you, that's not the case. God has a way of taking people with terrible pasts and using them to do some amazing, amazing things. Your past is not something that has to dictate your present or your future unless you allow it to. Because God has used some people who had some very messed up past. Some people who have done some detestable things. Some people that aren't worthy of him using them and he uses them anyway. The second thing I think is, is really important is that faith wins the day. Ruth, although young, showed incredible faith. Incredible faith to leave her people. Incredible faith to head towards Bethlehem. Incredible faith to, to ask someone to glean the fields. Incredible faith of, of being forward with Boaz. Incredible faith. And faith wins today. See, sometimes we have faith in ourselves. Sometimes we spend so much time, we don't have faith in God. We have faith in our resources. We have faith in our, in our, our checking accounts. We have faith in our jobs. We have faith in our positions. We have faith in our possessions. And, we, and so what we do is we, we take care of ourselves. And we say, well, God gave me this mind, and God gave me this job, and God gave me this possession, and God gave me all of these things, but God never gave those things to us so that they would take his place in our lives. There's, this, there's still this sense where, where faith is important. And, and, and so what happens is faith wins the day because in the Ruth situation, because she has faith and because she steps out on faith, God rewards her faith. It's the same thing that he did to Abraham. Abraham, get up and go to a place I'll show you. And Abraham gets up and he goes to that place. Abraham, take your son and take him to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. And Abraham gets up. I love the statement. Early in the next morning, Abraham. Now me, I would have said, well, well let's wait until like 11.50 p.m. I still went there. I still did it. No, early in the morning, Abraham gets up. Early in the morning, Abraham gets up, and God counts that as righteousness. Faith wins the day. Maybe what God is saying to you is don't wait for somebody to invest in you. Maybe today you should invest in someone else. Maybe if you will invest in someone else, then God will send someone along to invest in you. Faith wins the day. Here's what we're really asking, do you really believe that God wants you and I to have real relationships? And if we do believe that, will we step out on faith to make it happen? Well, maybe, maybe it's hard for you to find someone to invest in you. But man, there are people all around us that we can invest in. And it doesn't have to be this formulaic situation Sometimes you can just speak words of encouragement. Sometimes you can actually look someone in the eyes and ask them how they're doing and don't take I'm okay for an answer. Sometimes it means that we have to sit with people in a situation. Sometimes it means we have to spend enough time with them to really understand them. But it'll take that Faith step, and the faith step always wins today. 
the other thing that I love about this story, it says everyone's important to God. There are no throwaways. There are no people who are unimportant. There are no unimportant people. I love the scene on the cross where there's a thief and, and, and Jesus is being crucified between two thieves and, and one is hurling insults and one is saying, you saved other people, save yourself and save us. And the other one just simply says, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. And the Bible says that Jesus speaks to him and says, this day you will be with me in paradise. There are no unimportant people. There are no less than people. Even though she had come from this place that started in a terrible situation, she hadn't had a great start to her life. She was poor. She was widowed. She was far removed from where she was born and raised. However, God saw her and loved her as important. He saw her as part of his plan to bring the world a redeemer. She's the grandmother. She's the grandmother of King David. Try that on for size. Try on for a size that you're a Moabite woman and you're, you're born into this place where everybody looks at that place and says it's cursed. Try that on for a size and you step out on faith and you follow your mother-in-law to a, a different place and then God sees for it that you marry this guy Boaz and, and, and then all of a sudden you get in the lineage of Jesus Christ by being the grandmother of David and when you read the lineage of Jesus Christ, there she is is Ruth, the Moabite, Moabite woman in the lineage of Jesus because everyone is important to God. And maybe today you think I'm not important. Maybe you think you've gone, gone too much. You, you, you don't have enough stuff to offer God. Maybe you, you've been less important to the people who are around you. Maybe people have put a blue light special price tag on you. I'm going to date myself a little bit. Back in the day, my mom would lay and wait like a tiger waiting to pounce at the Kmart. And they would have these racks and they would have these blue lights. And every now and then they would turn that blue light on and there was a sale. And everybody would go running to the blue light. Maybe someone's put a blue light special price tag on you. And maybe because of your past. They said to you, you're not important. You're not worth anything. God wouldn't accept you. You've done too much. You've gone too far. I'm here to tell you that you're important to God. I'm here to tell you that Jesus died on the cross for you, that he looked down into the centuries and he saw you and he saw me there and he saw us in our unimportantness and he determined that we are important and he died and got up on Sunday morning so that you and you and you would know that you're important to him. Number four, your character matters. Your character matters. They say character is who you are when no one else is looking. When Ruth said, where you go, I'll go. Your people will be my, your, my people. Your God will be my God. Where you'll die, I'll die, and there I will be buried. She was saying words of character, and she went way beyond what she said. She gleaned the fields for food for her mom. She, she, she spent time taking care of her mom. She was a person of her word. And it's so hard sometimes to be a person of your word because if you're like me, you want, to, you want to say yes to everything. You want to help everybody. But you know what happens when you say yes to everything. You don't have enough hours in a day, enough time in a week to, to do all those requests. I remember a buddy said to me when I was executive pastor, I was saying yes to everything. And I wanted to do everything, but there wasn't enough time. There wasn't enough hours. And I remember a buddy coming to me and saying, James, that becomes a character issue. That becomes an integrity issue. And so I've learned to say no. I still feel a little guilty about it, but I've learned to say no. I can't do that now. Character. Character matters. I'm sure that it didn't cross Ruth's mind that centuries later, 
Millions would read her story of character and think, wow, because she far exceeds the expectation for a daughter-in-law. She honored her bitter, hurting mother-in-law. She put in long, physical, demanding days in the field to provide food for her mother-in-law, Naomi. She was a woman of character. How about you? Do you follow through? If you're going to be a person who, do, who does lifestyle investment relationships, character matter, matters. And then redemption is for everyone, no matter what your background, <laughs> address, your marital status, your, your sins of the past. Redemption is a gift from God for everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever, whoever includes you, redemption is for everyone. And then God uses little things in great ways, little obediences, little acts of faith, little suggestions of encouragement. God can take little things and he can use them in so many great ways. God's plan for Ruth was for her to be part of the lineage of Christ. And in order to carry out that plan, he laid out a series of little things which unfolded in such a way that it would bring us a savior. Ruth's life included famine, her in-laws moving to Moab, the death of her husband, and following Naomi back to Bethlehem and more, all for one thing, so God could take those little obediences and those little acts of faith and those little uh, commitment areas and begin to use them in some amazing ways. You never know what God is doing in your life through your little obediences. I've told you the story of a family that was just obedient who knocked on a door one day and invited me to what was then vacation Bible school. I don't think they knew when they did that what would happen in my life. I don't know, I don't think they knew the people that I would minister to, the churches I would pastor, the places I would speak all over the world. But they just did the little thing of knocking on a door. You know, sometimes we look for big, spectacular things. And God is just asking us to do the little things. The little things. Because what does the word say? When we're faithful in the small things, bigger things happen. The little things. And then last but not least, the decision that you make today has the ability to impact generations. The decision that you make today has the, impact, the, the opportunity to impact amazing things. So let me ask you the question again. Who are you investing in and who's investing in you? Let me just share some really practical stuff here. So I was in Michigan, Flint, Michigan, and I was doing a, a renewal week and the pastor there is a pastor by the name of Rob Prince. And he's a great pastor. Pastors of church of 2,700 to 3,000 or something like that. And I was, I was just spending time looking at his place, looking at how he does things, soaking everything in. And, and I did not get out of there before I said to Rob, Rob, you and I are going to continue to talk. We're going to continue to talk. I'm going to be picking your brain. You know, I'm going to be listening to you. Because here's the deal. I, I, I've decided I'm going to surround myself with some people who have been doing it longer than I have and who have been doing it better than I have. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not so prideful that I can't learn from someone. I said to Rob, man, I'm going to learn from you. And every time I had him by himself, I just picked his brain. There's another guy. I watch his services every week. Emmanuel Church, he just does it so well. Mark Prue. And I was on the campus of East Nazarene College in Boston, and I just had this conversation talking about some of the things that we're working through here. 
I said, Mark, I, I, I'm going to, I'm just going to keep on talking to you. See, it's just a lifestyle. Those, they weren't, it wasn't a formal, I didn't write him a letter. I didn't come up with some formal mentoring kind of thing. I, I just said, listen, I know you. I've seen the way you do it. I want to learn from you. But there's another guy that uh, I saw again in Boston. His name is Bob Johnson. He was a kid at camp. I was a camp counselor. Recruited him to go to college. Introduced him to his fiance. Did their wedding. And I, just for years, almost 30 years, I've just poured into him and talked with him and invested in him. He was going through ministry, and he was a, he was a guy that was before his time. So he was doing some amazing things 10 years ago, and they weren't received by the church he was at. And I would just keep on saying, Bob, keep on. You're before your time. Keep on. Keep on. Well, last week I saw him and got a chance to talk with him and continue to pour into him. It wasn't a plan. It was just a person who's been invested in investing in someone else. So let me ask you the question one last time. Who's investing in you and who are you investing in? Here's the reality. That vertical relationship is so important. It needs to be a real relationship. But so does the horizontal relationship. There's someone that God has for you who's waiting for you to take an interest in them, to speak into their lives. It doesn't have to be a pastor thing. Mine just happened to be a pastor thing. Maybe you're an electrician. Maybe you're a plumber. Maybe you're a consultant. Maybe you own your own business. And there's someone there that needs you to speak into their lives, to invest in their lives. Of course, as a person who has a relationship with Lord Jesus Christ, you're hoping, you're hoping that they, if they don't know Jesus, they'll know Jesus. Who are you investing in and who's investing in you? I'm going to bring up the last slide for a second because I want to continue this conversation. We're going to do what I call a, a pastor's book club starting in November. And we're going to be using this book, 11 Interspensable Relationships You Can't Live Without. The book is by Lynn Sweet. Lynn Sweet has been to this campus a number of times. You know, some of you know him. But, but he's talking about these 11. Everyone needs a Nathan. Everyone needs a David. Everyone needs a Timothy. Every, he talks about these 11 relationships that you just need in your life. And so we're going to do, do a book club. And if you're, not, if you're not in a small group, if you're not in a life group, we would love for you to join us in this life group. We're going to do it on Wednesdays. We'll have dinner before we do the life group. If you're already in life group, stay in your life group. They got plans for you, doing great things. But if you're not in a life group, we would love for you to jump in this bigger group with the idea that you might jump into something small. If you, if you have any interest in that at all, you want more information, just go to groups at sellingfields.com because I want to continue the relationship. I want to continue this series so that we can get to this place of asking Who's investing in us and who are we investing in? Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much that you made the greatest investment of all time in us, that you saw us worthy enough, you saw us important enough to make an investment in us that changed our lives forever. And so, Father, would you, would you help us to see other people the same way? Sometimes that investment that you made in us made, was made possible by someone like the Bowens knocking on the door and inviting me to vacation Bible school. Father, this is your way of connecting and reaching people through relationship. So, Father, would you help us to be faithful to others the same way you've been faithful in our lives? And Father, maybe someone here today does not have a vertical relationship with you. They don't know you as Lord and Savior of their lives. I thank you, Father, that if sincerely we pray in our hearts that, Lord, we want to know you. We want to be in relationship with you. We want you to forgive us our, of our doing our own thing, our selfishness, and want you to live in our lives. And, Lord, we just know that you will honor that request and so whether someone's sitting here in our auditorium or listening online and, Lord, and they, they want to pray that prayer, Lord, they can pray that prayer. And, Father, you will answer that prayer. 
I thank you that you're the God who still is in the business of reaching people where they are and transforming them from the inside out. And then there's some folks here today, Father, who this has been a tough series for because it brings out all the vulnerabilities in their lives. Father, I pray that you would hug them up real tight and that you would empower them by the power of your Holy Spirit to reach out in faith, to speak a word of encouragement, to believe in someone, to put their arm around someone and, and love on them the way that you and Christ Jesus loved on us. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in these days. We thank you that you're still in the business of doing real relationships. Now help us to go and do likewise. In your name we pray, amen. Hey folks, thank you for listening. We're gonna continue the conversation through a small group. God bless you. Have a great day.